when I was preparing for this, the Lord had a, a message that he just kind of put into my spirit. And, and we're, we're going to get to the, to the gist of it. Um, but we have to take the shackles off of him. All right? Uh, biblically speaking, there are a lot of places where you can see where people actually limited what God could do in their lives. So what we're going to do is kind of expand how we see him and take the shackles off of him. For, we're going to start in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 54 and 2. Enlarge the place of thy tent. And let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles, and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. So God says, enlarge the place of thy tent. This is Isaiah 54 and 2. Enlarge the place of thy tent. And let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. Now, all right, Bible scholars, let me ask you a question. Isaiah 54 comes after what chapter? It's not a trick question. Come on. What is Isaiah 53 all about? That's the messianic chapter. It talks about Jesus. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of the peace that is necessary, the chastisement that is necessary for us to have peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are what? Okay. So after God goes through that whole process, he then tells us to enlarge the place of our tent. Now, so often the Old Testament has physical representations of spiritual truths, right? We've gone over a couple of those. Uh, one of them, we'll do, we'll do just one real quickly. You remember, um, here's a truth. When you come to worship the Lord, you should not leave the same way that you came. Everybody, anybody ever heard that before? Well, how did God represent that in the Old Covenant? Go with me to Ezekiel. But when the people of the land shall come before the Lord in the solemn feast, he that entereth by the way of the north gate to worship shall go out by the way of the south gate. And he that entereth by the way of the south gate shall go forth by the way of the north gate. He shall not return by the way of the gate whereby he came in, but shall go forth over against it. That is a physical representation of a spiritual truth. When we come in here to hear the word of God, we will not leave the same. Just as God tells us in that verse, enlarge your tents. Now, what does it mean to enlarge our tents in the New Testament? All right. We're going to take a quick quiz here. Can you put the next one up? All right. I am a, I have a, I live in a. All right. Everyone, we should get this right because Pastor Bill kind of hammers this into us. And if we don't get it right, I'm the one who gets the beating. All right? <laughs> All right. I am a what? I am a spirit. I have a soul. I live in a Hey, Amen. We got that all right. Now, which one of those is the one that is made perfect? Actually, no, let me take that back. Of those three, is there any scripture that leads us to that? All right. How about 1 Thessalonians 5.23? And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I actually I love the King James. But I actually love the way that the Wesley New Testament puts this. And if you'll put that one up. And the God of peace himself sanctify you wholly and may the whole of you. What is the whole of you? The whole of you is the spirit, 
It is the soul and the body, the whole of you to be preserved, blameless, until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're going to go back to our little quiz. The spirit, soul, and body. All right. Now which of those you think? So when, when I said, Lord, I believe that you died, were buried, and God the Father raised you again. And I accept your sacrifice on my behalf. Which one of those three was made perfect? So who, says, who says spirit? Anybody? Who says the soul was made perfect? Who says the body? All right. I'm going to go with the body. That's just me. Is it the body? Is the body? Is it the body? Really, Sheila? You know, I, I'm, I'm the one on stage. If I say it's the body, okay, it's not the body. All right. So now we're down to either the soul or the spirit. Which one was made perfect? Which, what do you think it is? Let me hear. It's the spirit. Is, is it the spirit? I, I don't know. Ah, it's the spirit. What leads us there? What scripture leads us there? We're going to go to 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ... He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, we're going to look at this also in the Amplified. I like the way the Amplified puts this. Therefore, if any person is engrafted into Christ, the Messiah, he is a new creation, a new creature altogether. The old, which is the previous moral and spiritual condition, has passed away. Behold, the fresh and new has come. So now um, we know that when God tells us to enlarge the place of our tent, that he's not really talking about the spirit. Because once we accepted Christ, our spirit got married to the Holy Spirit and it was made perfect. So now there's only two things left. It's either the soul or the body. Now, is God going to tell us to enlarge our bodies? <laughs> Uh, I do a pretty good job of that at Foster's. <laughs> so we're going to look back at our, at our quiz. Yeah. So we're, we've identified that the spirit is made new. The body is not what we've been told to enlarge. So the one that we're told to enlarge or that we're, that we're going to enlarge is the soul. Now, what does God say about the body? In 1 Timothy 4.8, he says, Bodily exercise profit is little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of life that now is and of that which is to come. Now, he did not say that bodily exercise didn't profit at all. But he says it profit a little. So go to the gym. Take your walks. But it is not what we're focusing on today to enlarge our tents. Now, what we're going to enlarge is our soul. What is our soul? Our soul is our mind, will, and emotions. And the mind actually controls what we believe to be possible. All right? So if your mind is closed off to something, you can't actually go there. We're going to look at a couple of examples of what happens when we remove, when we as humans remove the limits off of the way that we think, all right? Anybody here, and these are all in the natural. These are not spiritual. These are in the natural. Anybody here familiar with a man by the name of Roger Bannister? You know what he did? For 150 years, athletes were trying to break a four-minute mile. Anybody ever tried to, I mean, anybody tried to break a six-minute mile in running? I mean, when I was younger, I could do it. It wasn't easy, but a four-minute mile. For 150 years, no one could do it. And then, on May 6, 1945, Roger Bannister did it. And again, 100 years before, no one could, they couldn't even come close. Once he did it, two weeks later, two people did it. So, and you've, you've seen the Olympics, when people are, when they're running a four or 5,000 meter, there's always a pace setter. So there's a pace setter that gets the group, that keeps them on pace, and then about halfway through the race, 
the pace setter falls off. Roger Bannister had a pace setter for his four minute mile. Two weeks later, that pace setter broke the four minute mile himself. And there were two people in that race who did it. For 150 years, nobody did it. And then within a span of two weeks, three people did it. Right now, the, I think the record is around three minutes and 43 seconds, which is moving. I, don't even try it, you won't, you won't survive it. All right. <laughs> Another thing that we've done, this is all in the natural. Anybody know who General Chuck Yeager is? General Chuck Yeager, on October 14th, 1947, he broke the sound barrier, 807.2 miles per hour. Um, prior to that, the, the Army had a commercial pilot trying to break the sound barrier. The plane started to shake violently at, eight, at 0.8 Mach, and when he landed, he told the government, I need a bigger bonus. The government said no, and they found a military pilot who just said, you know, I'll do it. And he did it. And no one even remembers the name of that commercial pilot because he, he didn't break the record. But right now, because of what General Chuck Yeager did, we actually have fighter planes that do, whose top speed is classified, but do in excess of Mach 2.5. We even have a couple of spy planes, uh, the SR-71, which is no longer in service, but it had a, a speed in excess of Mach 3.5. Anybody ever heard of escape velocity? You know what that is? That is the speed that is necessary for a craft to break the Earth's gravity and to put itself into orbit. Anybody know what that number is? It's 25,000 miles per hour. So if the shuttles don't, well, they're in dock now, but if they didn't attain 25,000 miles per hour, they can't leave the Earth's orbit. I mean, they can't leave the Earth's gravitational pull. All of this is a function of what General Chuck Yeager did in breaking a barrier. Now, we've seen what, what happens when we do it in that. Can you imagine what would happen if we did that spiritually? You know who the first person was to imagine it? Jesus. John 14, 12. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works then these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Now, one of the biggest problems that the body of Christ has had, and I, I want to thank Jeff, because I told Jeff what I wanted to preach about, and he said, okay, don't worry, I'll take care of a slide for you. And when I got home, as I'm coming home Friday night, he texted me because they're done. I look at him, and the only thing I could send to him was a, was a, a teardrop emoticon. Because I was like, man, that's perfect. That's exactly what I was thinking about. One of the biggest problems that the body of Christ has is that we have put God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, into a box. Now, boxes come in many, many sizes. Your box could be, uh, I, I need to pray about this. I need to go into my prayer closet. Some people actually have prayer closets. There's nothing wrong with a prayer closet. But you don't have to go into a prayer closet to talk to God. Some people tend to believe, uh, I think Joe was even talking about this this morning, is that God isn't in certain parts of the world. That he only operates here in the U.S. Well, God isn't limited to the U.S. Uh, God isn't, actually, put the next image up. That is the first image taken from Apollo 8 of the earth. And as you're standing there, if you were on that, on that spaceship, on the Voyager, you could look and say, you know what? My father isn't limited to that blue ball right there. Amen? Let's look at a different image. That's a representation of our solar system. And the reason I'm going through this, I want you to get a picture in your mind of just how big this thing is. Um, there's two non-planetary images in there. One is Voyager 1 and one is Voyager 2. Voyager 1 and 2, they were launched in the late 70s. Uh, Voyager 1 on August, I'm sorry, uh, November 13th, around 1980, it took a lap around Saturn and used Saturn's gravity to slingshot itself up and out of the atmosphere. 
they've been traveling away from the earth since the late 70s at approximately 38,000 miles an hour and has just reached the edge of our solar system. If you go to the NASA website, you can see they, they have a, a ticker on that shows you how far they are away from the earth and the clock is spinning on it like our national debt. <laughs> the Voyager, Voyager 1, just get it, I, just, I want you to kind of grasp something here. Voyager 1 is currently the furthest away from us at more than 18,489,770,000 miles. It's moving at just over 38,000 miles per hour or just over 10 miles per second. It currently takes light from the sun 18 minutes to reach it. It currently takes our radio signals 16 hours to reach it. This thing is big. And if you're on the Voyager and you're looking back at our solar system, you can say, my father isn't limited to that. Let's take another look. Let's take another step out. Let's take a step out from our solar system. That's an image of the galaxy that we live in. It would take those spaceships more than uh, tens of millions of years to get far enough away that they could take an image like that. And that there's a very small dot up there that represents our solar system. There are currently 300 billion stars in that one galaxy. And if you're standing there, and if you were on the border, you could look back and say, my father isn't limited to that. All of that is limited to him. Now, when you take a step back and think about just how big our God is, this kind of, kind of puts this psalm in perspective. Psalm 5010 says, for every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle upon a thousand hills. God used that termino terminology because they were agricultural. That was the limit of their imagination. But if he were writing this to us today, he would say the same thing about the stars. These are all mine. There is nothing that I don't, that, that is not within my control. There's nothing that I don't own. And there's absolutely nothing that can affect you that I can't handle. Now, so the Lord wants us to expand our mind, and then he wants us to get an understanding of who he is. Uh, and when we think about just the size and the magnitude of this thing, we can actually start to feel kind of small. I'm like, okay, all right, God, there's, so, so not only are there more than 300 billion stars in our one galaxy, but there are more than 300 billion galaxies, each with their own 300 billion. You can actually start to feel kind of insignificant. But you should. Why shouldn't you? What does God say about you? Um, let's see. Psalm 8.4. God says, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him. We are all in this room. We are all descendants of Adam. We're covered by that now. Because of Christ, we're the sons of God now. But God says, or I'm sorry, the psalmist actually says, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? So when I'm, when I'm doing this and I'm thinking, okay, God, why is it that I feel so small? He says, well, you feel small because you don't know who Jesus is. And this is reason. I mean, it's not like I don't, it's not like I don't know that Jesus is my savior. But sometimes we need to be reminded. What is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Jesus is the manifestation of the commitment of God, the commitment of the God of the universe. He is the manifestation of that commitment to make us successful. Jesus is God's commitment engaged. He is God's commitment in action. And when you think about the God of the universe who had no need of anything to actually put on a suit of clothing and come down here and walk among us. That will help us not feel as insignificant as that perspective can make you feel. All right. In Hebrews 11, God who has sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. He hath in these days spoken unto us 
by his son, who he, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So Jesus created all of that we just looked at. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down in the right hand of the majesty on high. So it says right here that Jesus is the express image of his person. Jesus is God's commitment personified. Our Father is committed to making sure that we have absolutely everything that we need in order to be successful in this life. Amen? All right. Now, back in Psalm 8, uh, we just read Psalm 8, 4. Psalm 8, 5 goes on to talk a little more. It says, for thou hast made him, we're talking about the man and the son of man, for thou hast made him a little lower than God and crowned him with glory and worship. And the, use, the reason I'm using the Geneva Bible there is because the King James says, for thou has made him a little lower than the angels. But the word there translated angels is actually Elohim. And everywhere else in the Bible, it's talking about God. And so God is saying, I have made you just a little bit lower than myself. Now, when I was studying for this, I can't, anybody know who Smith Wigglesworth is? Smith Wigglesworth has a, a, a book um, and I'm going to take a small excerpt from it about this verse. And he says the original Hebrew is certainly very emphatic, and I'm not going to even try to pronounce it. Thou hast lessened him a little time of God. Thou hast made him a little less than God for a little time. Now, as we, so, so in essence, what uh, Smith Wigglesworth is saying, as we take God out of the box, the things that we are supposed to do will become easier. We're going to get to that in just a second. In Ephesians 2 and 8, God says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are created in Christ unto good works. Jesus said in 14.12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. Now, admittedly, the body of Christ has been extremely hindered from producing these good works. The purpose of getting God out of the box is so that these good works that we're supposed to do can become manifest in our lives. Now, I absolutely love object lessons. And so we're going to just, just quickly, let me go down a tangent. Uh, most of the men in here, I'm assuming, were athletes, and probably most of you ladies were athletes. Uh, has anyone ever seen an athlete who suffered a uh, severe knee injury or broke a leg or something? One of the toughest things for that athlete to do, even though his injury even though surgically and medically the leg is stronger than it ever was, he's limited up here as to what he can do. So for a, an, uh, a running back or for a point guard who has blown out a knee, the toughest thing to do is for him to run full speed, plant on that leg that was blown out, and try to cut. He just can't do it mentally. It takes a very special athlete who can overcome that. Now. The body of Christ, unfortunately, has experienced a similar injury. But instead of doubt about being able to plant and turn and cutting hard, what we have to deal with is this. You know, Joe, healing went away with the death of the last apostle. What we have to deal with, you know, money's the root of all evil. You should not be prosperous. Now, a lot of those injuries came into the body of Christ around 300, uh, 300 AD when Constantine kind of united Christianity with a bunch of pagan religions without making sure that those priests were born again and they brought all of their junk into the church. And we're having to deal with it. Now, Ephesians 4.10 says, He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. 
for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And today, I'm standing before you in the office of teacher, sent to the body of Christ to encourage you. And this is what God told me while I was preparing this message. If it is in my word, believe it. Don't tie my hands. Don't place me in a box. I have more combinations and ways to deliver you from any trouble that you may see in your life or in the lives of others. I have more combination of ways to deliver you out of that than there are stars in the sky. Take me out of the box. Now, and, and if you've ever placed God in a box, don't feel bad because two of the most prominent people in the Old Testament put God in the box. The first time was Abram before he became Abraham. God says, you know what? Let me give you a son. Abram and Sarah said, hey, I'm too old for that. My womb is dried up. Actually, it was never, never alive. And he's old. So instead of believing God, they put him in a box and had Ishmael. And because of that, we are experiencing a lot of trouble today. Now, the funny thing is that God never said a word. He let him go down, but he still performed what he told him he was going to do. They just have to, and we just have to deal with the consequences of that first action. The other person who put God in a box was a man who talked to God face to face constantly. It was Moses. God told Moses, you know what? I am, they're just complaining in my ear constantly. I'm going to feed them so much meat that it's going to come out of their nostrils. So, so, so Moses is looking down on the mountain at a minute and a half hungry. He said, Lord, the only thing that, that exceeds their ability to complain is their appetite. How are you going to feed these people? And God kind of rebuked him and says, hey, is, is my arm waxed weak? He, he said, take me out of the box. Let me do whatever I say I'm going to do, and don't limit me. All right. Um, so, if God tells you to say this, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, that means I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Um, Another quote here, I, I'm, I'm going to go back to Smith Wigglesworth. There's a book that he has called Ever Increasing Faith. About Philippians 4, 13, the trouble is that we do not have the power of God in full manifestation because of our finite thoughts. But as we go on and let God have his way, there is no limit to what our limitless God will do in response to a limitless faith. But you will never get anywhere except you are in constant pursuit of all the power of God. And to be in pursuit of all the power of God, you have to take the limits off of him. You have to take him out of the box. So, when God says, and these signs shall follow them that believe, in my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. Believe it. Friday night when I was coming home, um, I got home about nine o'clock from, from our office in Pennsylvania and I'm watching TBN or TBN or Church Channel and it's a very famous pastor. Most of you would probably know him. And he was telling a story about how he grew up. He grew up with a, with a stepdad. And one day his mom said, you know, hey, come on, we're, gonna, we're moving to California, get your stuff. And he said, okay, where's dad? She said, well, he's not coming. So they got a divorce, of course. And this was when he was a little boy. Many decades later, he goes, you know, I, I really did love that man. And I'm going to find him. So he found him. He's staying in New Jersey. He's a, a lawyer. And he calls him up. 
And his dad said, oh, my God, you've got to come out here. You've got to stay with me and my, my new wife. We want to catch up. And he did. And at dinner, he's telling his stepdad, his dad, about his story about how he became a pastor. And he said all through dinner, his dad just sat there like this, looking at him, didn't say anything. But after dinner, he says, you know, I get up every morning and walk. The doctors tell me I have to walk. I, I'm 75 years old. I just had a heart attack, and my heart is in, in bad shape. So would you get up and walk with me? He says, of course, Dad. So they get up and go walking. And during the walk, he says, son, I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. He says, okay, Dad, it's very simple. We just have to say a simple prayer. His dad hits the floor on his knees hits the ground on his knees. And he's thinking, oh my God, I don't want to get on my knees in this park. But because his dad was on his knees, they got on his knees and they prayed the sinner's prayer. And the very second that they prayed the prayer, his dad looks up and goes, I want you to pray for my heart so Jesus can heal my heart. This pastor of an extremely large church in California said, wait, dad, we don't know if God is going to heal your heart. put him in a box. His dad says, Jesus is going to heal my heart. You have to pray for me now. Hold on, dad. We don't know that God will. Pray for me, son. Okay. He prayed for him. After he prayed for him, his dad stands up and goes, we got to go tell my doctor that my heart is healed. Wait a second, dad. So they go. Again, his dad is 75 years old. They go to his, his doctor. He said, and my dad's doctor is a Jewish doctor that we have to tell that Jesus just healed my dad's heart. So my dad starts saying, Jesus has healed my heart. And, and this pastor said, the first thing out of my mouth was, oi they. I have no idea what that means, but I'm going to assume it's some sort of a Yiddish word. And he said, oi they. Well, after they told the, the doctor that, this pastor goes back home. Three or four weeks later, he gets a phone call from his dad. He goes, you know what? I just had a test done on my heart, and it is completely healed. His dad was 75 years old, was in trouble, imminent trouble of having another heart attack, was given another 15 years and died when he was 90. Now, this pastor had put God in a box. And so what I'm admonishing each one and every one of you is, is that in our day-to-day -day walk, everyone knows that we are Christians. If somebody comes to you wanting prayer, you pray. I don't care what the situation looks like. You pray. They could have a withered hand, but if they come to you, their faith is reaching out for a point of contact, and you be that point of contact. Because it's not up to you to do it anyway. If somebody's experiencing family problems, you pray for them. If somebody's experiencing debt problems, it doesn't matter what it is. If they come to you for prayer, you pray. Because their faith is looking for a point of contact. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, for his son so loved the world that he left him us. And if we don't do it, it won't get done. Amen? All right, so. It really doesn't matter what you're to pray for. I was just talking to, to Ron this morning. I'm surprised. He actually said a couple of scriptures that were in my sermon, so I'm going to borrow them back from you right now. I exhort you, therefore, this is 1 Timothy. I exhort you, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving thanks be made for all men, for kings or politicians, for all that are in authority, police officers, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. It doesn't matter if your favorite politician or if the politician you absolutely hate is inside the beltway acting a complete fool, we have to pray for them so that the decisions that they make won't stop us from leaving, leading a quiet and peaceable life. How does God do it? I have no idea. Take him out of the box. It ain't up to me to figure out how he does it. We just pray for it. So we're going to wrap up here. Second Corinthians, we're going to wrap up. Second Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.18. But as God is true... Our word toward you was not yea and nay. So what we're actually picking up is on the tail end of an argument that Paul is making to the Corinthians. 
our word toward you is not yea and nay. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timothy, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. For all of the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen, unto the glory of God by us. The reason I pull the scripture up is a couple days ago I was talking to a young man who had lost his house. He was you know, living in somebody's basement, he and his wife. And as I'm talking to him, I said, well, are you Christian? He goes, yes, we are. We, my, my wife and I, we are born again. I said, okay, so what promises are you standing on right now? And he had no idea what I was talking about. I've been a member of this body for over five years, and our shepherd has hammered the promises of God into us. Matthew 18, 19, again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done of them of my Father, which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. So the reason that I put that scripture up is right now, if there's anyone out there who is standing on a scriptural promise that you need agreement with, I'm going to ask you to come down. And because of this verse, we're going to, in, we're going to act on this verse and believe that it happens. Where any two of you agree as touching anything. Now, the, here's, here's a caveat. I'm, I'm going to ask you to limit yourself to the promises of God. God never promised, so don't ask me to get into agreement with you, that he'll put you on the Forbes list. All right? What did God say? He says, I'll supply all your need according to my riches because you are in Christ Jesus. That's what we can pray. Now, God never said for you males that you're, you'll marry a swimsuit model or for you females, that you'll, you'll marry some male superman. But what God says is he that finds a wife finds a good thing. All right? So if you're standing on any scripture whatsoever, I am anointed to be the teacher today. Let us get into agreement for what it is that you are standing in faith for. I don't care what it is. You bring it here, and you and I will get into agreement. Amen? Any, any, any need, any prayer needs, please bring them forward.